Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Jensen with Trees Forever, and I'm a program manager and field coordinator. And uh, I'm here with Debbie Flegel, our uh, program manager, field coordinator in Illinois. And uh, you all are at the right spot. This isn't how to flip houses. This is Trees and Natural Disasters. Uh, this is a presentation we put together with uh, the timeliness of the uh, storms that happened here in August. We're still waiting for a few other folks to go ahead and log on. Uh, we welcome those that are with us. Now, here's the thing. You should be able to hear us and see us and see our screen here, um, but we can't communicate back and forth. That is to say, we can't hear you folks, but the way that you can interact with us is uh, two ways through the chat function. So um, on your control panel there, there should be a chat function. In fact, I'm gonna type right now, welcome, if I can type and spell, everyone. And that did not go to everyone. That went just to Debbie and I, so I'm glad I checked that out. Welcome everyone, and that's gonna go to the entire audience we send and so chat is a way that uh, you can interact with us and let us know if you can't hear us or if there's something uh, going on the other way is through the questions box and certainly uh, the questions box is for that any questions you might have uh, throughout the presentation you can type those in the box and we'll either respond in kind uh, or at the end we'll come back and go through the questions so that we get all of those answered to the best of our abilities, certainly. So that's kind of how you can interact with us. Uh, again, you should be able to see us and hear us. Uh, and if not, uh, let us know in the chat function there. Uh, there is a telephone call-in option uh, for those that might not be able to get their uh, microphones working or, or whatever the case may be for their, um, uh, their speaker, I should say, with their computers. Well, I'm going to give us just a few more minutes here, unless, Debbie, you want to say a few words. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for spending your lunch hour with us. Um, we'll get started here in a few minutes. Okay, so for those that are with us, this is going to be your opportunity to uh, try out the chat function. So I want to know uh, who received how many inches of snow where you live just a couple of days ago when we had the, uh, the snow. So use the chat function and just type in how many inches of snow uh, you had where you live there, and we'll get an idea of where some folks might be from. Now, just a point of reference in that chat function, uh, there are some drop down options of who you're going to chat with, whether it's specifically one of the organizers, myself or or Debbie or the entire audience. And so the entire audience is what I've been uh, clicking on there so that everybody can see. Uh, welcome. Oh, no, this is interesting. I see a little hand raised. That's a function I'm not familiar with. Oh, and Lisa's got her hand raised too. Now, how do I, uh, let's see here. So what does that mean for the hand raise? Oh, looks like we might have lost a couple of folks here. Boy, I hope I didn't. I don't think I did. <laughs> well, we're all learning here today. Learn something new every day. That is a lifelong learner, folks. And uh, that is me with a capital M-E. And nobody's uh, typed in with... Uh, how many inches of snow on the chat function. So let's hope that that works. Debbie, why don't you try that out? How many inches of snow did you have where you live? We got none. It didn't snow here. 
We just got rain. Didn't snow where I'm at either in northern Iowa, so all you southerners can have some of that early snow. Okay, here's a, a question in the question box. Let's see. Uh, ah, question already. Best way to get things going. So why did some trees break off in the storm, but some were pulled out by the root? Are you going to talk about this? I know some of it depends on the type of tree, but I'm wondering if the tree was in the process of dying, and that's why it broke off. Great question, and yes, that will be addressed in the presentation. Nice little uh, teaser. I appreciate that, Deanna. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And uh, Laura's chimed in, no snow, where she's at. Excellent. Well, thank you, Laura. And we've got just another uh, minute here. So for any that have just joined us, welcome. My name is uh, Jeff Jensen, and I'm a uh, program manager and field coordinator with Trees Forever based in Northwest Iowa here. And I'm uh, along with my coworker, Debbie, and she's going to be presenting on trees and natural disasters. Uh, we welcome you all. Um, you should be able to hear us and see us and see our screen. Uh, but of course, we can't hear you folks at home. However, there are a couple of ways to interact with us. There is a chat function uh, so that you can uh, chat to the entire group. And then there's also a question box where you'll be able to type in questions that you may have. Uh, and we may be able to answer those right within that chat box, or we'll come at the end and go through the questions and uh, be sure we get everybody's questions answered that had, had something to ask there. So I have 12 noon. And I think for the sake of uh, keeping us on track here, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is going to sound like a loop, but I'm Jeff Jensen, field coordinator and program manager with Trees Forever, based up in Northwest Iowa. I'd like to welcome you all here over the noon hour for an opportunity to talk about trees and natural disasters, a very timely subject with the storms that happened. Uh, we've got a great resource with Debbie in Illinois. And in fact, uh, I think I'm going to be quiet, um, mention a couple things, and then turn it over to Debbie. Again, you should be able to hear us and see us, but we can't hear you. So if you have a question, use that question box. Um, we'll try to answer the questions as we go along, um, or at the end, we'll certainly go through and get everything answered. This will be recorded, so you'll have an opportunity to come back if you'd like and uh, um, uh, watch again at your own leisure or uh, suggest this to a friend or family member. Uh, I think it's going to be a great topic, one that I'm very interested in. I'm going to be quiet. Um, Debbie, why don't you give us an introduction and just jump right into it. All right. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us over your lunch hour. My name is Debbie Flegel, and I'm a program manager and field coordinator with Trees Forever, located in central Illinois. And um, this webinar is, uh, as Jeff mentioned, is very timely, following the derecho, um, following tornadoes that spun up from the derecho here in Illinois. So we're going to talk about um, types of disasters, what you can do to help mitigate those. Um, if you have any questions, please type them in the, the question box or the chat comments, and we will get to those as we go through. So with that, I'm going to turn off my video so you can see my screen, and we'll get started. So today we're talking about trees and natural disasters, how to mitigate storm damage. This is a photo that was taken in a neighborhood on the southwest side of Cedar Rapids during the derecho. And I want you to pay attention to what it looks like now. Um, at the end, I'm gonna show you what it looked like after the storm was over. So for those of you um, who are new to Trees Forever, we are a nonprofit organization whose mission is to plant and care for trees and the environment by empowering people, building community, and promoting stewardship. We've been around for 30 years. Um, right now we have a staff of about 20 between Iowa and Illinois. Our headquarters are in Marion, Iowa. And we've planted just about three and a half million trees between the two states in the last 30 years. We do have national projects and um, national, have worked on national projects and received national recognition for those. And we are a membership-based organization. So these webinars are um, provided to you free um, by donation. So if you would like to um, donate to Trees Forever, you can go to the website to do that. 
we do invest in green. Um, on average, between the two states, we work with about 200 communities, landowners, and farmers annually. On average, we work with about 7,000 volunteers, and we provide over $650,000 annually with technical assistance and grants. So what we're going to talk about today, just to give you a brief introduction, we're going to talk about some benefits of trees. This may be review for most of you. Some weather-related natural disasters, some non-weather-related natural disasters, how we can prepare for a natural disaster with our trees, and then what is our response and readiness to a disaster happening. But first, I want to talk about some of the benefits of trees. Why do we plant trees in general? This time of year, the beautiful fall color. We plant them for energy savings to help um, with our heating and cooling. We plant them for wildlife habitat, provides food and shelter for animals and pollinators and other insects. We plant them to help with our stormwater management. They help um, suck up the water after a rainstorm to help reduce flooding, improve air quality, improve water quality, and to beautify the places where we work, live, and play. So in communities, trees can serve energy. Shade trees um, often help shade our buildings and our streets and the sidewalks. and can actually increase the lifespan of our pavement by up to 60% by keeping the heat down on the, on the pavement. They help cool our homes. Planting trees on the northwest side can help prevent uh, the northwest winds, help shelter your home from those cold winds. And also planting shade trees on the east and west sides can help cool your home from the hot summer sun. Trees provide food and, and shelter for animals and insects, pollinators, even in our urban environments. Particularly, trees are important for pollinators. Pollinators are bees, birds, wasps, butterflies, moths, beetles, flies, and in some cases, even a few mammals. And they are responsible for pollinating over 75% of our world's plants. Pollinators are responsible for, for pollinating 35% of all of our agricultural crops. So they're very important to our, our ecosystems. How do trees help with stormwater management? When it rains, the leaves intercept the rainfall and the water is stored in the leaves and the bark as well as in the roots. So the, the rainfall is absorbed through the roots and it helps prevent the amount of runoff that is uh, moving off of the surface of the land, off of the impervious surfaces. So trees can help reduce the amount of runoff and one large tree can absorb up to 57,000 gallons of rainwater during a 10 to 12 inch rain event. This is a graph to show you the types of so a small, a medium, and a large tree, and how many gallons of rainwater they intercept annually versus over their lifespan. So, annually, if you have a small tree, um, a 10 inch diameter, a crab apple is going to intercept 331 gallons of water annually, a baroque 751. But the annual gallons intercepted by those trees at maturity, if you look at the baroque, that's almost 5,000 gallons of water annually during a, a one inch rainfall for a large mature, large mature tree. As trees grow and mature, the benefits they provide increase. Trees help improve our, our air quality. They can mitigate the effects of climate change by absorbing and storing carbon dioxide, giving off oxygen. They store the carbon dioxide in the trunk, branches of leaves, and roots as they grow. And then once the tree has died, the carbon dioxide is released via the decomposition of the dead wood, 
mulch, and other tree care activities. Trees also filter out particulates in the air, helping reduce the amount of air pollution and smog. Trees increase property values. A large mature tree on your home can in increase the property value by average of $13,000. Trees improve neighborhood appeal. They encourage people to want to move into the neighborhood, attracting other neighbors, businesses, and increasing your community tax base. Trees planted in your downtown shopping district of your community can influence people to spend more time in the area make more frequent trips, and be willing to spend more for goods and services. And trees improve our public health. If anything, 2020 has shown that we all need to get outside and recreate. And we want to do that in areas that have a lot of trees. Trees restore us physically, mentally, and emotionally. There have been scientific studies that show that hospital patients who can see trees and green space outside of their hospital windows heal faster, need less pain medication, and have fewer complications. And trees are fun. Granted, at this age, I'm not going to be climbing a tree like that, but when we were little kids, we loved to climb trees. If nothing else, just sit out in the lawn chair under the tree and relax. Using iTree, which is a uh, software developed by Davy Tree and the U.S. Forest Service and others, we can calculate a dollar value to the benefits that trees provide us. So in the left side, you're looking at the energy savings of one large tree per year. So we're assuming we have a, uh, an oak tree planted in our yard. This is the amount of energy savings that tree provides us each year. And as, again, as the tree grows to maturity, over 40 years, that tree has saved us nearly 50,000 kBTU of energy. On the right-hand side, it's the amount of carbon that has been stored in the trees. So again, one large residential tree. So you have a, an oak tree planted in your yard. As the tree grows, the amount of carbon stored grows exponentially. So upwards of by year 40, the tree has stored nearly 8,000 pounds of carbon. So let's talk about natural disasters. In the Midwest, these are the typical natural disasters that we have. Um, we just have a plethora. We have ice, which is what's coming up upon that season. We have wind. And prior to August 10th, I would have combined a tornado and a derecho together as a windstorm. But after seeing the effects of both, um, they're clearly two different types of storms, flooding and drought. So let's start with ice damage. The accumulation of ice can increase the weight of tree branches anywhere from 10 to 100 times. The accumulation of ice between a quarter and a half an inch can cause small branches to break and weak limbs to break. Accumulation of more than a half an inch of ice can cause much larger branches to break and can cause extensive tree damage, ultimately resulting in total tree failure. Factors determining the amount of severity of tree damage during an ice storm include the amount and duration of the accumulation of ice, the exposure to the wind, and the duration of the storm. The susceptibility of tree species also plays a factor in the type of damage. Trees that have weak branch junctures, dead and decaying branches, included bark, and unbalanced tree crowns also play a factor. 
as we start talking about these different types of disasters, I want to preface this by saying that safety with safety is the number one priority in all of these. If you are going to be out working on trees after a disaster, your safety is the number one priority. Make sure you are wearing your proper PPE, personal protection equipment, particularly if you're working with a chainsaw. Always look up for dead or hanging branches. Avoid removing ice from the tree. Let it melt off. And if you need to do corrective pruning, do it dur during the dormant season. Always stay clear of downed power lines. Make sure you call the utility company if the, if the tree limbs are entangled in the power lines. Tornado, windstorms. I wanna give you the definition of what a tornado is. A tornado is a rotating column of air that touches both the clouds and the ground at the same time. They vary in shape and size, and the length of time on the ground varies, but they usually do a lot of damage in a very short amount of time. The trees are, and the leaves and branches are stripped off of the trees. Trees are uprooted, twisted, and broken. And if the winds in a tornado reach more than 200 miles an hour, a tree can be completely debarked by the smallest piece of flying debris. Trees susceptible to tornado damage include those that have, again, weak branching structures and junctures. They have internal decay. They are older trees with dead wood or trees that are leaning with more than 45 degrees. Other factors can include an unbalanced tree crown or a canopy that's made up of many small branches and twigs. Fast growing trees such as maples are highly susceptible to wind damage. One common message that we have heard from folks who have been through tornadoes and have lost all of their trees is the impact to their utility bills. Their utility bills on average have gone up anywhere from 40 to $60 per month after a major storm where they have lost their trees. So it's very important that um, you think about replanting after a, a disaster. The larger photo here, excuse me, is from uh, a tornado that was in hit Washington, Illinois in November of 2013. And the, the leaning uprooted tree is from the tornado that hit Taylorville, Illinois in the December of 2018. So the depending on this type of tree can result in different types of damage. A derecho. Those of you in Iowa are, have experienced this. A derecho is defined as a widespread, long-lived, straight-lined windstorm that is associated with fast-moving group of severe thunderstorms that potentially rival hurricane wind forces. So the wind speeds in Cedar Rapids were upwards of 140 miles an hour, and that would be the equivalent of a Category 4 hurricane. So again, what we're seeing as far as the damage is we're seeing a lot of large, older trees, completely uprooted, trees that were twisted and broken, a lot of branches that are broken high up in the tree. Again, make sure you're looking up. As you can see in the inset, there is a large broken hanging branch and that is was hanging over someone's house in their driveway where they come in and out every single day. On, on your trees that have been damaged by derecho as well, you wanna prune broken branches if you can. To trees that have more than 50% canopy loss or that the trunk 
has been damaged more than 30% of its circumference, most likely are going to be need to be removed. They are not going to survive the, the devastation of that injury. Flooding. Flooding is a wait and see type of a natural disaster. Tree's recovery after a flooding event depends on what kind of tree it is, how long it was underwater, and the condition of the tree prior to the flooding event. Flooding impacts the root systems first. The tree is inundated with water and sediment is deposited among the above the roots, which limits the amount of oxygen to the roots. The water scours the soil and exposes the root, <coughs> excuse me, exposes the roots. And then the trees are also susceptible to physical injury by floating debris. Some of the signs to look for to determine if your flooded tree is stressed is chlorosis, which is yellowing of the leaves, defoliation, your tree just may lose all of its leaves, reduced leaf size if they're trying to recover, and shoot growth. They may develop sprouts on the trunk or at the base of the, the stem, and the crown may have some dieback. The tree may turn its fall colors very early in the year. Due to flooding, trees are very susceptible to secondary attacks caused by insects and diseases. You can, do, after a flood event, you can do a soil contamination test on your soil. And if your soil is not contaminated, you wanna aerate the soil around the tree, water it as needed and provide mulch and prune off any dead, damaged, or diseased branches. With flooding events, as well as the effects of ice and wind storms, you want to monitor your trees for several years afterwards. If nothing else, take a photo of your tree once a year. And from that photo, you will be able to determine annually if your tree is recovering or if it is declining. Drought. It seems to be more and more frequent that we have wet springs and then a drought throughout the summer. Um, but drought is another wait and see type of a disaster. It may take many years for trees to succumb to the effects of a drought. Signs of drought include wilting, curling, burning or browning of the leaves, premature leaf drop, and dried out needles. Long-term stress from drought makes trees susceptible, again, to secondary attacks by pests and diseases. How can you manage your trees for drought? Water, water, water. You cannot water enough. You should water your trees the equivalent of one inch of rain per week. So that would equate to about two to three gallons of water per caliper inch of the trunk. So if you have a 10 inch tree, a trunk, a tree that has a 10 inch trunk, you would need to water that tree about 20 to 30 gallons per week throughout a drought. You want to water your trees until the first hard frost and you want to water them slowly. Also, you want to make sure you're watering your large mature trees they are going to take longer to show the signs of drought but if you're watering them you want to water the large trees as well as your newly planted trees you want to mulch to help hold that moisture in the soil you also will need to avoid extensive pruning during a drought because that's going to stress the tree even further as they try to heal that wound and then do not fertilize your trees during a drought So some questions after a natural disaster, can my tree be saved or do I have to remove it? Well, there are a lot of factors you need to consider before removing or, or saving your tree. 
Number one, what condition was the tree in prior to the disaster? Was it in good condition or was it starting to decline? What is the age of the tree? Is it early on? Is it just a young tree recently planted or is it a tree at the end of its life cycle? What type of species is it? What kind of tree is it? We are more likely to save a mature oak that has some minor damage versus a, an ash tree that we know is going to be affected by the emerald ash borer and maybe already has been. What is the suitability to the site? Is the tree planted in the right place? Is there any potential for the, the disaster, for instance, flooding to reoccur and damage this tree any further? Did the disaster happen during the early growing season or when the tree was in its dormancy? And what was the extent of the damage? Anytime there is more than 50% of the crown of the leaves and branches gone or more than 30% of the circumference of the trunk has been damaged or the tree leans more than 45 degrees, it needs to be removed. This tree is one that was damaged by a tornado in Ottawa, Illinois, that after the derecho, the tornado spun out of the derecho, and this is in a, um, a yard in town, and this tree is gonna be slated for removal because you can see that more than 30% of the trunk has been damaged, and there's no way that tree can recover from the severity of that damage. Non-weather event disasters. Anytime a something happens that affects, has the, the capability of affecting an entire population of trees, that can be considered a disaster. Emerald ash borer is a disaster. It's killing ash trees all across the country. Thousand cankers disease. It's a disease that combines the activity of a fungus with the Walnut twig beetle that affects black walnuts. And here in the Midwest, we are right in the heart of black walnut country. Bottom left is the Asian longhorn beetle. It is a um, invasive beetle that likes hardwoods, really likes maples. In the 1990s, there was a um, uh, infestation in Chicago and they ended up eradicating the Asian longhorn beetle from Chicago by clear cutting and burning all of the trees in a neighborhood. And then the spotted lantern fly. Although it is not in the Midwest, we hope it does not get here, but they don't just feed on trees, they feed on our agricultural crops, they feed on our, our fruits and our vegetables and our plants. So they are, they eat a lot of different uh, material. Some other disasters, non-event, non-weather related to disasters that we've had over time, the Dutch elm disease wiped out all of our American elms. Now we have disease resistant species of elms that we can plant. The chestnut blight wiped out all of our American chestnuts. Again, there are different varieties of chestnuts now that we can, that we can plant to to replace some of those. But anytime a disease or a pest affects an entire population, that can be considered a non-weather event disaster. So how do we prepare for a natural disaster? Living in the Midwest, any one of those ice, flooding, tornado, derecho, drought, any of those can happen at any time. We can start by planting the right tree in the right place. If you have the space to plant a large tree, plant a large tree, which means you have a large open space. This is not a tree that was planted in the correct place. This is the wrong tree in the wrong place. Consider when you're planning a plant of where you're going to plant trees, what is the mature size of the tree going to be? This tree is much larger than 20 feet, so it should not be planted under the utility lines. 
it's impeding the, the light pole. It's also impeding traffic because it's too close to the corner. So think about planting the right tree in the right place and develop a plan, have a plan. When you move into your house, you can't do much with the trees that are already there as far as moving them, but you can take care of them and make sure they are, are taken care of. They have proper maintenance. If you have, if you're planning to plant new trees, think about what you're planting, why you're planting them, and where they should go. If you're planting small trees, they need to be a minimum of 10 feet from your house. Large trees need to be a minimum of 20 to 25 feet away from your house. And large trees should be a minimum of 30 feet away from your utility lines. By planting a diverse mix of species, it is also going to help you prepare for the next type of disaster. As I mentioned, as we were going through many of the different types, the susceptible trees tend to be those that have weak branching junctions or are very fast growing. Those are more susceptible, particularly during wind and ice. So determine what kind of trees you wanna plant get pest and disease resistant species and have a plan as to why are you planting this tree why do you want to plant trees is it for energy efficiency in which case you want to plant large shade trees is it because you want to plant trees for wildlife and pollinators so you're going to get trees that have produce a nut or a fruit or have flowers make sure you are choosing the the tree that is appropriate for your house or your property where you want to plant it what type of soil do you have how much sunlight is this tree going to get how much space and also when planting in town you want to make sure you're checking with your local city tree ordinance they may have a list of trees that they prohibit planting in town. So make sure you're checking that as well. But the biggest thing is plant a diverse mix of species. Trees Forever has several resources available if you're looking to, if you wanna plant some trees, but you're not sure what type you wanna plant. The Under the Canopy resource is a great publication. It was put out by the Illinois Forestry Development Council with a lot of um, forestry, urban forestry partners throughout Illinois. And if, as you unfold this, it becomes a, a poster that has a wide variety of trees that are suitable for Illinois and, and Iowa as well. But the nicest thing about this is if you look at the very bottom on the right-hand side, there is a chart that shows which of these trees are small and would be suitable for under utility lines or they get very large and need to be have large open spaces. If you are interested in receiving um, some of these, um, I can I can mail them to you. Um, at the end, I'll put up my email and my contact information and just shoot me an email if you want me to send you some of these. Another resource for um, selecting tree species is on our website, treesforever.org. Um, we have trees and shrubs for pollinators. These are all native Midwest species of trees and shrubs. So they're going to um, provide benefits to wildlife and pollinators, but they're also going to provide other benefits for you as well. Many of them are great shade trees. Uh, many of them have, some of them have unique bark. So a lot of diversity among these species. This is not an exclusive list. There are others that are not on here, um, but this may be a, a starting place if you're trying to decide what kind of tree you want to plant. We also have some other resources on the website. If you go to um, the tree selection page, we have a planting the right tree in the right place, of course, but we have resources on planting trees for linear sites, so sites that do have power lines. 
We have sites without power lines. We have trees that provide dense shade, um, moderate sparse shade, as well as trees to plant for a windbreak. So those would be evergreen. So Trees Forever has a lot of resources to help you in your tree selection, but there are many others um, available as well. So we're still in preparing. How can you prepare for a natural disaster? Regularly prune your trees. Oftentimes, uh, small communities do not have the staff or the time to do a regular pruning cycle on their trees. So this is where our Trees Forever Tree Keepers can come into play. Trees Forever Tree Keepers program is designed for people who want to become more knowledgeable about their trees and wish to become stronger advocates for the trees in their community and neighborhood. Prior to 2020, um, it was limited to cities in Iowa, but as with everything else, in 2020, we have taken the Tree Keepers training virtually, so anyone anywhere in the country could attend Trees Forever Tree Keeper training. And you can find more information about that on our website as well. But pruning makes your trees more resilient to withstand storms. You want to make sure that your trees um, have a central leader. So you should be able to follow the stem of the tree from the base of the ground all the way to the tip top. It should be one stem. You want to prune off any dead, diseased, or damaged branches. We want to prune off any sprouts that are coming from the trunk or the base. You want to prune off any rubbing or crossing branches, and you want to prune for safety. So any low-hanging branches um, that are blocking the sidewalk or are blocking traffic, you want to prune those off. When you are pruning, you want to Remember to never prune off more than one third of the canopy at any one time. So if you prune off one third of the branches this year, wait another year to prune off more. Also prune your trees during the dormant season as much as possible, particularly oaks and elms. They need to be pruned during the winter time to prevent the spread of disease. So this is an example of what happens if we don't prune our trees. So versus top versus bottom, which one is going to be more likely to survive a windstorm or an ice storm? Well, it's not going to be the one on the top. By regularly pruning your trees, it makes the tree more stable and more resilient during storms. More like more less likely to come apart. How do you respond? If you've been through a disaster, your trees are still standing, what do you do? Contact a licensed certified arborist to come and look at your trees. In Illinois, you can contact the Illinois Arborist Association. And it, elsewhere, Illinois as well, but Iowa, you can contact the International Society of Arboriculture. Both organizations have a find an arborist um, feature where you just type in your zip code and arborists within 50 or 100 miles will pop up. So if you have any questions or any concerns about your trees, contact a licensed certified arborist. If you have been through a natural disaster, I want you to be aware of scam artists. Um, we have heard from numerous communities that have been through tornadoes in particular here, is that the scam artists show up within hours of a natural disaster. My former coworker lived in Taylorville. In 2018, they had a tornado that hit on a Saturday night at 530. By 1 a.m., there were random people with chainsaws showing up at people's homes, knocking on doors, willing to take down their tree. So make sure you are uh, contacting a certified arborist. If someone shows up to your house, you can ask to see their arborist certification and to see their insurance. 
in Illinois, we have a resource to help if a community has been impacted by a natural disaster. We have the Illinois Urban Forest Strike Team. It's made up of a group of specially trained arborists and foresters who volunteer their time to help communities impacted by natural disasters. These professionals conduct rapid tree assessments on public trees or on privately owned trees that will impact public right of ways. The team is a collaboration of the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, the U.S. Forest Service, and Trees Forever. It was modeled after the response to Hurricane Katrina in the South. The reason we want to have professionals look at our trees is because we are losing our canopies at a, a tremendous rate, whether it's due to storm, old age, diseases, or pests, we're losing our urban canopy, our forest canopy. So we want to save as much of that as possible. And our most recent strike team deployment to Ottawa, Illinois, um, the arborist visited a residence that had a large red oak um, and they wanted to know whether it should come down or not. It was a city owned tree and there had been three um, tree companies that had come by and given estimates and said that that tree needed to come down and it was going to cost two to three thousand dollars. This was a tree that was in the public right away. The arborists on the strike team assessed that tree and said no it did not need to come down. It could be um, saved with some corrective pruning over multiple years. So we want to save as many of the trees as possible. Each of the strike team deployments are different based on the needs of the community. Um, this most recent uh, deployment to Ottawa, we were looking at about 75 different street and park trees um, that the city had questions on. They have a part-time staff, so they do not even have one full-time person uh, managing their trees. So they needed some assistance. We've in Taylorville, they the public works is in charge of the trees. So we looked at all of the public street trees that were in. The tornado impacted zone from the southwest to the northeast part of town. So, some additional resources for you to, these are available for you to download on our Trees Forever website. Um, we have fact sheets on your trees for each one of the disasters I talked about wind, flood, drought, and ice. We also have a, a resource for community leaders on how to plan and, and get plans in place for when and if a natural disaster touches your community. And we also have an informational brochure on our website about the Illinois Urban Forest Strike Team. Unfortunately, there is not one in Iowa. It's up to each individual state to um, determine whether or not they have uh, develop a strike team, but it is a great resource to have. So for those of you in Iowa that are now re starting to think about planting after um, the derecho and disasters, now is a perfect time to plant trees. We have several grant opportunities for you in Iowa, the Alliant branching out, it's plantings on public property, uh, grants from one to five thousand dollars, and it's communities that are served by Alliant. Um, you can go to our website for more information, but the deadline for applying is November first. Another program um, is Black Hills Energy Power of Trees grant program, and it is this is for communities that are served by Black Hills Energy. It's plantings on public and private property. And the deadline again is November 1st. Then we have a seedling program that's available for Iowa and the Quad Cities in Illinois. It's a rolling deadline um, for planting seedlings. So if you have a seedling giveaway, um, it's to help restore the, the canopy that's been lost and destroyed with across our towns throughout our state. 
So with that, you know, remember, I asked you to remember what that house looked like at the very beginning. This is what it looked like after the derecho. They lost nine trees out of their yard. Three of them landed on their house um, to the extent that they couldn't get out of their house. Um, neighbors had to help them uh, exit their home. Um, they had nine trees already removed, and I looked at a few more that were still standing in the backyard, and unfortunately, a few more um, needed to come down due to the amount of cracks and severity of the damage to those trees. So it's a clean slate, basically, for people who have been through the derecho or tornadoes start thinking about where you want to plant your trees, what kind of trees you want to plant. Um, here's my contact information. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Or if you want one of those under the Urban Canopy publications, if you are located in Illinois, um, any community that is a Tree City USA community should have received those. Um, they are available at the University of Illinois Extension offices as well as um, soil and water conservation district offices um, other organizations throughout the state have them as well so but if you would like to receive some of those i can send you some and with that um, we will take any questions that you might have jeff you're on mute No. <laughs> so questions. I can't see any of the questions. But... Yes, Mike, I did. I did get your, your forms. Thank you for sending that. Does anyone have any other questions they want to ask? Okay, let's see. I have a. I apologize. I'm having a hard time reading the questions here. Um, someone says they have a white oak about 10 inches that was topped off. If it doesn't get oak wilt, does it have a good prognosis? Seemed quite healthy before the storm. It's in the woods. Also, it's very jagged at the top. Should I have? Given it a clean cut off or just um, or just leave it. Well, one thing with uh, you should never top your trees. Um, that is a a um, pruning habit that should be outlawed. Um, the reason being is when your tree is topped, it will respond by sending out more shoots and sprouts from, from the um, cut areas. And so over time, those branches will become um, more weak. They're, they're less stable in wind, particularly wind and ice. So if it was, if it was, um, it would be something to monitor over time. Trying to see if there's any other questions here. Um, Mike, is this webinar uh, eligible from I for credit CEU credits? Um, no, unfortunately, it's not. OK, 
Okay, does anyone have any other specific questions? If so, if we if I can't see them, you can email me. Um, again, my email is here, or you can go to the Trees Forever website and email us there. Um, this webinar will be available for viewing on the Trees Forever website um, in a few days. So you can go to treesforever.org backslash webinars and um, you can see all of our uh, previous webinars that we have held over the last six, eight months. So I would like to thank all of you for joining us today, spending your lunch with us. Um, again, if you have any other questions, feel free to email me and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Jeff, is your mic working? No, I can't hear you. <laughs> so um, thank you for joining us. And uh, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to, to email us. Have a great afternoon, everybody.